Welcome all to this 16th lecture of Principles of Statistics. Today we're going to carry on with decision theory, but in this case what we're going to do is to restrict ourselves to the toy model and then explore the three concepts that we've seen. And I do want to remark that um, the three concepts I'm talking about, um, Bayesian uh, rules and um, ad you know admissible rules and minimax rules, these are all non-asymptotic in nature, right? And that's very important because so far we were justifying things from a from an asymptotic point of view. And now with decision theory, you know, we not only have a unifying theory um, for inferential procedures, but also we are analyzing things from a uh, so-called finite sample point of view. So what we'll see is that um, the dimension can play a role uh, at this stage, okay? Uh, so for these properties. So let me write um, all these things down uh, a bit more carefully. So, um, so now, so now we explore the three concepts of these. Of course, I'm talking about the previous ones. Uh, three concepts in more detail. for the toy problem and decision problem would be. Um, of mean estimation in the normal model, right? So as I said just a minute ago, um, it is important to note that, so note that these properties or concepts um, are non-asymptotic. So something I haven't mentioned is that it's, you know, it's natural that we start by, well, uh, that we look at directly at the MLE, okay? Because the MLE, we know it has really, really good properties asymptotically speaking, but then we can also question, you know, what happens for uh, finite samples. And so we will answer, you know, um, some, or we will find some of the properties of MLEs in finite samples within this theory of decision theory, uh, decision theory. But of course, there are many more um, properties that MLEs have for finite samples that we will not be covering. Yeah? Okay, so I guess, um, so it is natural, let's say, so natural to, to consider the MLE, yeah, to see how it works also for finite samples. Um, and then uh, the last comment is that, um, so the last comment is that, or in this case, we will see that the, the properties change with the dimension. Okay, so theorem one. So we're going to talk about admissibility and um, minimaxity, if you like, for the MLE. So let x1 to xn be iid normals with uh, mean theta and variance sigma squared so where sigma squared is known okay and um, theta you know therefore it's just a mean parameter 
and this belongs to some capital theta that in this case we're going to take to be the whole of our. Yeah? So then what we have is that the MLE in this problem, which is by the way, you know, I remind you given by the sample mean is um, admissible and um, and minimax for estimating theta. So this is essentially the decision problem that we're considering. And then we need to also fix the loss function. Um, so this is in, in quadratic risk. Okay. Okay. Um, so how do we, how do we show this? Let's go to prove. And uh, the first thing is that we're going to set sigma squared to be one. Okay. And this is without loss of generality. And you should check this as in you should, you know, it's a good exercise to uh, make sure that you understand the proof is just to do it with this general sigma squared and you'll see that nothing changes really. Okay. Is as long as sigma squared is, is known. Yeah. Um, so as in it's only com cosmetic changes. Yeah. Okay. And so by the way, I mean, it's just very normal in, in the literature. So in research, especially, um, you know, to, to simply take sigma squared to be one, just, um, when, what we really want to deal with is the case in which the variance is known. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter, generally speaking. Okay. Um, so let's note something. First of all, so we want to look at the quadratic risk of the MLE, right? Um, so let's do that. So then we have, um, this quantity here that is, uh, the xn bar minus theta, which looks a bit weird. So let's just do it a bit more carefully. Okay. Um, squared. And this is no more than, of course, the variance, right? And the theta of the Emily, right? Of, of this sample mean. And now this sample mean then, of course, has variance one over n, right? Okay. Okay, so having said that, um, what we have, and this is for all, by the way, so for all theta in the parameter space, right? So what does this mean? Well, it means that um, the risk is constant in theta, right? So then by the last proposition, so proposition uh, three, and the second part, um, we just have to show that we, you know, the, the, the estimator is admissible, right? We show, well, maybe it's just nicer to write it as it's sufficient to show, right? Um, because I mean, it could be shown in different ways, but so it's sufficient to show. that um, the MLE is admissible, right? Because if we do that, well, then of course we show that it is admissible, which is one of the uh, two things in the statement of the theorem. But then on the other hand, if you remember from this proposition, uh, this part two was saying, well, if you are admissible and have constant risk, then you are minimax. Okay, okay. so, we showed this by contradiction. Okay. So we show it by contradiction. Okay. So let's assume therefore that, um, so assume we have some Delta, right? So assume that Delta, um, dominates the MLE, right? IE in this case, what we have is that um, our 
delta theta is going to be less or equal to 1 over n for all theta in an R, and there exists a theta prime in this capital theta such that the risk at it is strictly less than 1 over n. Okay, so assuming this, let's see what we get, you know, what, what is the contradiction? So we have that. Um, so note the following, which is that we want to write out this risk. Okay, so let's work on this guy. So this risk is no more than, you know, the difference between the delta and the theta. But what we're going to do now is just to add and subtract the mean of the estimator. So this really works for any estimator, what we're going to see, but then of course we're interested in, in this one that dominates, um, you know, in the, as in this works for any estimator, but then we will impose this uh, dom dominance condition to reach a, a contradiction. Yeah. Okay, so this quantity, you know, if you just expand the square, what you get is that this is delta minus the expectation squared plus, okay, let me go slowly, um, so expectation and the theta of the expectation and the theta of delta minus theta squared plus two times the expectation and the theta of the product of these quantities. Right? Okay, so now, you know, this guy is not random. So really, you know, this expectation will go away. So we'll just have the square. And then again, this guy is not random. So we can take it out of the expectation. And then once we take it out of the expectation, what we get is that, of course, this guy is going to give us mean zero. Yeah. So essentially what we have is that this is zero. Yeah. And the first term in here is the variance and the theta of delta. And the second term, as I just argued, is um, is just the difference between these two quantities. So let me write directly B theta B theta, where you know B theta is no more than the difference between these quantities. Yeah? So this is the bias basically. Is the bias. Okay, um, so now we have that. Um, so remember, we want to show this something like this. Well, we want to assume something like that. And this 1 over n is no more than the variance of the MLE. Yeah, so that's the variance and the theta of the MLE. So really what we have is that we are relating, you know, so in the right hand side, we have the variance of the MLE and here we have the variance of this guy. So, you know, how have we um, related uh, variances? Generally speaking, well, we used um, um, the kramer rao lower bound, right? Uh, let's do this. So let me, um, or let's at least, right. So we want to show, um, you know, contradiction. So we will want probably a reverse inequality to this one here. So this is why I'm also thinking of kramer -Rau, Yeah, I want to bound the variance below by something that will be essentially this one of n, and then we we'll get a contradiction um, if there is no equality ever. That's uh, right, in, in strict inequality ever. Yeah, so, so this second bit. Okay. Um, so by um, so by the you know by biased uh, kramer rao inequality. Okay, we get that um, the variance that we are considering the is bounded above by the derivative with respect to theta of the expectation and the theta of the delta, this squared, and then n times the Fisher information matrix, which in this case is just scalar. And not only scalar, but it's actually one if you check your example sheet. Um, okay, so now this is fine, but this is not, you know, this derivative is not necessarily related to what we had, or it doesn't seem to be. 
But unless we look at this, right? So this guy actually has, you know, the same as this guy. And so we can derive, uh, we can differentiate um, uh, this expectation in terms of the B because, you know, we have this B and so we'll have essentially a condition on the B and then we can work on that condition to, to reach a contradiction. Okay, so what I'm saying is just write this as one plus B prime theta and then divide it by N, okay? Okay, um, so, so what do we, okay, so let's gather, you know, what we have i.e. what we have is that b, sorry, and this b is missing square, um, so b square theta plus 1 over um, 1 plus beta prime of this squared has to be less or equal than 1 over n yeah, for all theta here. Okay, so Okay, so then um, what conclusions do we get out of this? Well, um, there are two conclusions, right? At least two. So these two guys are positive, right? So this guy and this guy are positive. And, um, and this means that it means in particular that each of them has to be less than one ren, right? Uh, well, less uh, than or equal to. Uh, one of n, so so. Let me just write that. So this guy, um, essentially, is bounded. Let me just remove the theta dependence. Is bounded on R. Okay, so that's one thing. Then what's the other thing? Well, I look at the second term. If the B prime is positive, then we're going to get that the numerator is larger than one. And so the whole, uh, you know, term, second term will be larger than one over n, and that cannot happen because the first term is positive or non-negative. And so then um, what we also know is that, um, you know, the B prime must be less or equal than zero, i.e. that is non-decreasing, yeah? The B is non-decreasing. Um, sorry, non-increasing, yeah? And actually, it must be strictly not increasing around theta prime. Okay. Okay. Um, so, what do we get from this? Well, let let me make a claim. Okay. So, I will claim that there exist sequences theta um, minus i um, going to minus infinity and theta plus i going to plus infinity such that so for which the um, the derivatives at each of them so maybe let me shorten now things to say plus minus yeah? so this goes to zero as the i goes to infinity right? um okay so so this is a claim yeah so let's show show the claim so if not so again we argue by contradiction this claim this little claim um so if not then what's going to happen well if it weren't going to zero then it means that uh, for some epsilon and m greater than zero, both of them, um, the following happens, and is that the b prime of theta is going to be less than minus epsilon for all theta in absolute value larger than capital M, right? Um, so what does this mean? Well, it means that um, So it means that B cannot be bounded, right? Because if you have, you know, yeah, I think it's clear, yeah. Right. 
Okay, so we reach a contradiction and therefore we assume, uh, we can assume that we have these two sequences. So let's see what we can do with these two sequences. Um, so then, so then um, the limit as i goes to infinity of the, you know, the left hand side here, this all this guy. So we have, um, let me maybe just write it all, theta squared, theta i, and this is both for the plus and minus, okay? So I'm sort of working simultaneously for both, plus one plus the derivative of this theta plus minus i divided by n. So this guy is going to be you know, it's going to be the limit as i goes to infinity of the beta squared and the plus minus. And we're also going to get, um, you know, we just said that the derivative is going to go to zero, so then we're going to get one over n. Yeah. And um, so from uh, this, this equation, so let me maybe call it star, so from star, so from star, um, what we get is that the limit as i goes to infinity of um, b, you know, directly, is zero. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have that on both ends of the real line. We're going to get. Uh, a limit that is zero, but now remember that we have the derivative uh, to be non-negative, non-positive, non and so, you know, the 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 contradiction is clear now because um, so let's let's um, so from da -da -da -da, comma maybe, and since um, b prime theta is uh, not positive for all theta in the parameter space, we get that v theta cannot be anything else than just zero for all of those thetas. Yeah. So thus, uh, the cannot, you know, the doesn't exist a theta prime here, such that we get, you know, the strict domination that we needed, or essentially that, um, the derivative is strictly less than zero. Yeah. Okay, so we reach a contradiction and we're done. Yeah. Okay, so let's make a remark. Um, so this is in line with another remark that I made uh, in the last uh, lecture. So remarks, maybe. First one is that, you know, whilst um, this, well, whilst um, the MLE is not a base rule for any prior, um, so, you know, there doesn't exist a prior for which xn bar is base. Um, what we do have is that, you know, this is something we mentioned at the end of the last lecture, that it is a limiting limiting base. Yeah? And this is because every um, admissible rule is going to be limiting base. Yeah? And this, in this case, it is limiting base. Um, you know, for instance, we can find the following sequence of rules. Um, so this is going to be, so for sequence So for sequence, and it will make sense in seconds. So is the, is the, of course, these are the base rules for uh, prior pi, and this pi we're going to um, index it by, you know, this new squared, and this is okay. So this is as new squared uh, goes to infinity. Okay. It is limiting base, and now we need to define this pi. So where 
pi not theta but nu is you know an n zero nu squared prior. Okay. okay. And then second uh, remark is that theorem one also holds for dimension two, okay? However, we now see, so let me introduce theorem two. We now see that theorem one is not true for um, dimensions uh, greater than or equal to three, okay? So let now have x, um, sorry, not b. Let now have x distributed according to a normal distribution. We're going to go directly to the case in which we have theta and the identity. And so, um, of course, this is, you know, this is theta, so this is theta in a parameter space that is RP, okay? And as I just said, we are going to consider the case of P greater than or equal to three. Then we get that this Xn, which in this case is just X, because we, we can take just a single data point to have this counterexample, um, is inadmissible. inadmissible um, for the quadratic risk. Okay, um, so that's the statement. Now for this, so to show this theorem, of course, we're gonna have to have some um, decision rule that dominates um, this MLE in this case. And uh, we're also going to need a lemma, so let me say, this uh, more explicitly. So to prove theorem two, um, we're going to need two ingredients. And I guess what I want to emphasize is that they are important uh, by themselves, right? You'll see this later on so that our important for their own sake. And of course I'm saying this because I want to introduce them separately then. You know, I want to introduce them um, explicitly out of the proof. I don't want them to be lost uh, in, the, in the proof. Yeah? So one of them is um, the so-called James Stain estimator. And let's credit you know, uh, Stain. So first introduced by Stain. Um, and um, Okay, so let me define it actually. Um, so this is going to be this delta JS for James Tate. Um, and it's going to be essentially the X. So that would be just the MLE. So the usual MLE times this factor that I'm writing. So it's just this. Okay. So it's the X, which is, you know, as I said, the MLE. But we have this factor, factor that is actually a, a bit of a shrinkage. It's going to give a bit of shrinkage uh, to the X, and I will uh, probably talk about this in the next lecture, but let's just for now put it aside. So where, um, just for clarity, the by this I just mean the usual uh, Euclidean norm. Yeah? Okay. So this is from 1 to P of the X, J squared. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, okay. Um, and then, okay, so this is one of them, sorry. And then the second uh, ingredient is uh, Stain's lemma, yeah. Okay, um, which, 
you know, we introduce now. So lemma, and this is lemma one, by stain. So let, um, so what we're going to do now is actually to go to one dimension, and this is because uh, we'll be able to analyze this uh, James Stein estimator, you know, sort of um, coordinate by coordinate. And so let X um, be uh, distributed according to normal distribution with, you know, for, uh, with one dimension and one dimension um, with theta therefore belonging to capital theta being just the real line. And um, let G be a function that goes from the reals to the reals that is differentiable. And such that it satisfies the following, uh, which is that the absolute value of its derivative is bounded in mean, yeah. Um, so I mean, I just, yeah. um, so it's expected by, yeah. Okay, so then what do we have? Well then, what the lemma says is that the expectation and the theta of this product, gx times x minus theta, is going to be equal to the expectation and the theta of the g prime. Okay, and this is this is um, actually for all theta. Okay, so let's prove this. Okay, so we prove this uh, as follows. So we say so. This is essentially. Well, let me. Well, okay. So first of all, we we prove it only when g is bounded, okay, so this is just for simplicity. And so um, proving it for when g is bounded is essentially integration by parts. It's really nothing else than that. Yeah? Um, so how does, you know, how does the proof go? Well, you just take the um, guy that we're interested in and then write it out uh, using, you know, the PDF of the standard normal distribution, well, not standard normal, but uh, the normal distribution. And so this is just one over square root of two pi. Um, and integral over R of you know, GX, and this is lowercase now, e to the minus one of two of X minus theta squared, yeah. the X. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is, you know, I've done nothing here. Um, so what we realize is that this guy is actually just the derivative of the exponential, right? So we can write this as, um, um, well, nearly, nearly the derivative, right? So we need a minus here. Um, so this is gx and then derivative with respect to x of e to the minus one half x minus theta, okay, dx, right? And so now we can apply uh, integration by parts and have that so integration by parts. is going to give us minus one over square root of two pi gx, and then we integrate. So we get this quantity here, um, and this is from minus infinity or evaluated from minus infinity to infinity. And then we get a minus, but with the other minus it cancels out and we get this quantity here. Okay, so integral over R of the g prime x e to the minus one half x minus theta. And so we are essentially done, yeah? And this is because, you know, if g is bounded, then this is this goes to zero, g bounded. So in fact, you know, you will realize that we don't need g to be bounded. We just need this guy, you know, to have tails to go to zero. So that's less than being bounded. 
but it's it's okay. I mean, it's fine. Yeah. Um, and um, and then this this quantity here is no more than the expectation that we were looking for. Okay, so this shows the lemma, and we are done for today. And in the next lecture, we will prove, um, you know, theorem two. Okay, I hope you enjoyed, and see you again in the next lecture.